So yeah, uh, my name is Alexey. I'm from Zalando, um, and um, yeah, my talk is about multi-objective learning to rank. Um, to start with, I will introduce these two persons. Um, one of them is Francis Edgeworth, and the other one is Wilfredo Pareto, and they are believed to independently come up with the notion of optimality for problems with multiple objectives. Um, and we will get back to that notion of optimality later. But for now, let's discuss what um, multi-objective optimization is in general, and why do we have to deal with such problems at Zalando. Um, one may think of multi-objective optimization as uh, something exotic, but I, may, I, I can argue that this is a very common situation to be in. For example, whenever you buy something, when when, whenever you're buying something, you want to maximize the product quality, and at the same time, uh, you want to have a good deal. Whenever you're booking a hotel, um, you consider the distance to the city center, and at the same time, you want to have great facilities. Whenever you're uh, looking for a new job, um, you would like it to be as satisfying as possible, but at the same time, you want to maximize the uh, the compensation, or maybe you want to minimize the distance between uh, the office and your home. So you got the idea. Um, not surprisingly, while working on the ranking of the catalog uh, at Zalando, we also encountered a multi-objective optimization problem. And before I go uh, into the details of that, um, I want to show you the slide that we often show. And um, here we need uh, just this number in, in the orange frame. And it just shows that the catalog of Zalando is very huge. And the way we uh, sort the articles when uh, the users are shopping on the website has a great impact both on the user experience and on the business KPIs. Um, when I joined the ranking team, um, more than a year ago, our ultimate goal was to increase user engagement. And we successfully achieved that goal by applying suitable machine learning techniques. But our solution had one side effect. It was giving a lot of visibility to non-fashionable articles. And although um, many people actually buy them, we believe that giving too much visibility to such articles creates less of inspiration for the users and um, hurts their experience and the image of Zalando in the long term. And that's how we got this other goal in addition to increasing the user engagement, which is to keep the catalog of Zalando inspiring and fashionable. Um, and this is what motivated this bit of work that I'm presenting today. Uh, yeah, here comes the outline. Uh, a bit late, but the good news is that we're done with the introduction. Um, next, we will have a very short recap on learning to rank. Then I will um, talk about several approaches one can take to solve multi-objective optimization problems. And after that, we will focus specifically on learning to rank and on um, the lambda marked algorithm in particular. Um, then I will describe some experiments that we performed and finally um, talk about conclusions and some future steps we're planning to take. Um, it is needless to say that in modern search systems, the number of um, search results is typically way larger than users can or are willing to explore. And uh, um, we need to sort or to rank uh, the items retrieved by our search system. Um, the, a very common way of ranking items is uh, ranking them by numerical scores assigned according to a certain model or a scoring rule. Um, and the process of obtaining uh, a model or a scoring rule by applying some machine learning techniques to some historical data 
uh, is called learning to rank. Um, at the heart of any ML method lies uh, an optimization problem. And uh, the, a major component of every optimization problem is its objective function. And so choosing, uh, by, by choosing the objective function uh, when performing learning to rank, uh, we may have a big impact on the resulting model and on the performance of the ranking. Um, so this is one of the levers we can uh, exploit when uh, we want to target several goals and to optimize for several objectives. Uh, to make things a bit less abstract, um, I want to give this example um, of a very popular ranking metric that can be used as an objective. Uh, this is an instance of the so-called normalized discounted cumulative game that but many of you are familiar with, I'm, I'm sure. Um, here, the index size used to, to enumerate um, different result lists in our data, and the index J is used to enumerate items, individual items in these result lists. And um, so for the sake of brevity, I won't go into the details of the metric itself, but I, I, want, I just want to stress that um, the key to the definition of um, any instance of NDCG is the definition of individual item relevance. And here in this example, the relevance is assigned based on the interactions that the users had with the items. So if there was no interaction, then relevance is set to zero. If the, if the user clicked on the item, then it's one. And if the user uh, purchased the item, it's three in, in this particular example. Um, um, so, by optimizing this NDCG with this relevance definition, um, we are looking for, for a model or for a scoring rule that would upsort uh, those items in the data that users interacted with. And by doing so, we're expecting to obtain a model capable of identifying and bringing up uh, these items that the users are likely to interact with on the next day when the model is deployed. Um, however, um, this is not the only objective we can consider. Say, even if we, we want to optimize the user engagement alone, uh, still there are other sources of relevance and uh, other indicators of item relevance that we can use instead of um, user interactions. For instance, we may um, use the explicit feedback that the users give, such as their likes or dislikes. And also, uh, we may use um, labels assigned by human assessors, for example, fashion experts. And this gives us a different definition of relevance and leads to a different objective that we may want to optimize as well, together with the interaction and the CG presented, presented before. And also, in addition to customer engagement, uh, we can have other things to optimize for. Um, for example, at Zalando, we care a lot about post-order customer experience. And we may want to minimize the return rate or to, to, to reduce the delivery times. And finally, as I mentioned before, uh, in the context of fashion, optimizing solely for user engagement can lead to giving a lot of visibility to non-fashionable items. Um, and therefore, we, can, we, we may want to optimize the fashionability of our catalog together with the engagement. Um, the problem um, with um, the, the difficulty with optimizing several objective, obje objectives is that usually there's a trade-off between them, and th there's no single solution that would uh, give the maximum value to all of them simultaneously. Um, at the same time, 
it doesn't mean that all solutions are equal, because there can be uh, dominated solutions. Domination means that we can improve on some of the objectives without hurting others. For example, on the uh, on this in this plot, uh, the the dots represent the gray dots represent dominated solutions. Um, say this solution is dominated by this one and by this one because we by by moving from this dot to this dot we're increasing both objective t and objective one um, so we're saying that this is a dominated solution and these are dominating solutions and um, therefore it makes sense to focus only on those solutions that can't be dominated by others and such solutions are called Pareto efficient. So that's how the efficiency or the optimality is understood in the context of multi-objective optimization. Um, uh, and um, uh, the set of all Pareto optimal solutions is called a Pareto, the Pareto front or the Pareto frontier. Uh, and when, when we optimize for one of the two objectives alone, so, say for, for objective one here. It is natural to expect that we end up somewhere near this orange uh, dot here. And at the same time, the, the value of objective T corresponding to this dot can be too low. And instead, we may want to have somewhere, somewhere in the middle of this Pareto front, frontier. Um, and the question is, of course, how do we get there? I will now um, talk about several approaches to multi-objective optimization. Um, and while uh, I will be presenting them, let's think. Uh, let's have in mind uh, that we have two ranking metrics based on two different relevance definitions, because uh, there's typically some relevance definitions behind any ranking metric. So the first approach one can take when there are several goals uh, to, to target is to optimize for one of them and then post-process modify somehow the resulting solution to address the other goal. So that's probably the most uh, primitive way of, um, um, of solving such multi-objective optimization problems. Uh, in our example of fashionability and user engagement. We, may want, we can, for example, optimize for user engagement alone, obtain a model, and then multiply the scores that, the, that that model assigns to the different fashion articles by a certain fashionability score to also improve um, fashionability. Um, the other thing we can do is to redefine our relevance. So we can define a new relevance uh, that would take into account both the interactions that users had with the items and the fashionability of them. Um, say, just continuing this example, we may assign different relevances to fashionable and non-fashionable articles when they are purchased. Um, the third approach is called scalarization. And scalarization is, uh, consists of combining uh, the objectives, the several objectives that we have into a single scalar function and then optimizing that function. The most uh, straightforward way of doing so is to form a linear or being more precise, a convex combination of the, of the objectives we have um, and scalarization can be illustrated by this picture here. So if we denote the, the value of the, first, of, the, of the first objective and of the second objective on the real line with these two gray dots, then the value of the combined objective will lie on the segment between the two dots. And the position of this value on the segment uh, is determined by the this parameter alpha. 
Um, scalarization has several properties that are worth noting. Uh, first, every any solution that, it, that is produced by scalarization is necessarily Pareto efficient. Um, it is pretty straightforward to see because, say, if we pick any value of alpha uh, from from this interval and solve this optimization problem and get a certain solution, then there can't be another solution that increases one of the objectives without hurting the other one, because in that case, this hypothetical solution would give a higher value to the scalar function, and that would contradict to, to the fact that we obtained a, a solution to this scalarized problem um, on the previous step. Also, under some assumptions, uh, this method allows uh, finding any Pareto optimal solution that exists in the original problem. And also, this method is more straightforward to apply when we have more than two objectives compared to the other two approaches. By varying the value of alpha, we are thus generating different Pareto efficient solutions. And the question is, how do we one of them later to bring to production. Here we can take the following approach. We can um, specify a constraint on some of the objectives and um, pick that Pareto efficient solution that satisfies this constraint and uh, brings the, the best value um, to the other objective. And the constraint can be set on the existing baseline, for example. So if there's a, so let, let's say this gray dot here represents the existing um, baseline. This is currently in production. So we may say that we want to keep the value of objective one at least at the current level, and then pick that Pareto efficient solution that satisfies this constraint that lies, that thus lies above this dashed line and gives the maximum value to the objective one. I should say that in such situation, we can also use a constrained learning to rank method. And constrained learning to rank is, a, is an area of research at the moment. Um, in particular, if, if you're interested, if you wanna uh, use constrained learning to rank, I um, I would uh, refer you to this recent paper, um, and constraint learning rank would um, amount to uh, taking one of the objectives and maximizing it subject to certain constraints on the other. Um, uh, yeah, so as I said, this is an area of active research at the moment. Um, and we, we didn't use this approach in our experiments. Um, now I will talk about how one can implement scalarization uh, using um, lambda mart, uh, using the lambda mart algorithm in the context of learning to rank. So how can, how can one learn to rank uh, with multiple objectives? Um, and I will be focusing now on the scalarization approach. Just as a, as a um, short reminder, um, the lambda mart algorithm is a boosting algorithm for optimizing ranking metrics, such as NDCG. And its iteration consists of two steps. On the first step, for every item and every result set in our data, we're computing the so-called lambda gradient, which can be interpreted as the desired change in the current score assigned to that item. And then at the second stage, we approximate um, this lambda gradient by growing a decision tree, and that decision tree is added to the ensemble. Um, so here's uh, an animated uh, image that shows the process um, of um, 
of um, building a model by this lambda mart algorithm. Uh, so here we have one page, one result set of items consisted, consisting of 84 positions. And the blue bars, they show the lambda gradient. So for each position at each iteration, we're computing this desired change in the score. And the, the dots here, they're marking these items that the user purchased. And you can see how they're moving uh, close to the beginning of the list as long as uh, the lambda mart algorithm is uh, training. Um, now, in order to implement the scalarization approach, we can just uh, compute the lambda gradient, so this desired change in the score, using one of our metrics, um, one of the objectives we, we, we want to optimize, and do the same for the other objective, or for um, the other objectives, if we have more than two objectives. And then combine the resulting lambda gradients using the respective coefficients and get a new combined lambda gradient and then pass it, just pass it to the tree construction phase. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, in our experiments, we implemented this using LightGBM. LightGBM allows passing a custom objective function for computing the lambda gradient to the training procedure and we used, um, um, so we implemented this combined objective using Cython. And also, since uh, the lambda gradient is, uh, can, since lambda gradients, they can be computed separately for each uh, result set, it's straightforward to parallelize the computation. And we did that using OpenMP which gave a, a big um, increase in the speed of the computation. And after this parallelization, the speed was um, roughly the same as that of the original LightGBM um, implementation. Um, then we performed several experiments using a data set from um, the catalog of Zolando. It consisted of roughly 50,000 result pages collected when the users were browsing the website or searching for something in the catalog. Um, we used two objectives. Both of them were instances of NDCG but with different definitions of relevance. Um, the first definition was similar to the one presented in one of the examples before, so it was based on user interactions. The other objective um, was also an NDCG, but with relevance set to a certain fashion score of the item. Uh, and as I said, our goal was to uh, upsort both popular items, so items with, um, with which the users are likely to engage, and at the same time, uh, relatively fashionable articles. Um, here, um, we have the results of our offline experiments. Um, this circle here denotes the baseline. Uh, then the diamonds, they represent um, uh, solutions obtained using the post-processing approach. Then the triangles correspond to this approach with a uh, combined objective, uh, um, I'm sorry, with combined relevance. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the squares, they denote solutions obtained using 
scalarization with different values of alpha. And as you can see, um, the, the scalarization is dominating the other approaches. So it would be a natural choice for subsequent developments. But some further investigation um, showed a, a, a certain undesirable effect of the solution obtained using scalarization. Um, namely, the visibility of articles that were popular but non-fashionable increase, and the visibility of articles that were fashionable but not popular also increased. And at the same time, the visibility of articles that were fairly popular and at the same time quite fashionable went down, which was undesirable in our case, and uh, prevented us from uh, continuing uh, to, to, to use this approach and to further test it. Um, and this brings us to, uh, to at least two <laughs> conclusions. The first one is that a Pareto efficient solution can have this mixed effect. So it, may, it can give um, a higher visibility to articles that are popular from the viewpoint of each of the objectives that you have individually, but at the same time, give lower visibility to articles um, relevant from the viewpoint of all of those objectives simultaneously. And second, the evaluation based on this, based on this a multi-objective space can be misleading because we had a dominating solution in that space, but it didn't result in a really better scoring rule, at least given um, these additional requirements that we have. Um, and as some future steps, we're planning to further experiment, experiment with a combined relevance approach. So we want to see if um, um, it, it, it has the same mixed effect or uh, whether it's better in this regard. And also with um, the data set, the data set augmentation. For example, we may, in order to solve this fashionability issue, we can try learning from uh, data generated by users who actually buy fashionable items. Um, yeah, and um, so I would like to finish the, my talk uh, with this short disclaimer here. Yeah, and of course we are hiring. Okay, it's your last chance to get a t-shirt. Now, perhaps we could have some people asking questions who haven't asked questions before. Oh, there's somebody there. Fantastic. Would you like a t-shirt? Sure. sure. <laughs> what enthusiasm. <laughs> Cool talk. Um, I'm wondering about the concept of fashionable, how you determined <laughs> what is fashionable and and, um, <laughs> um, and also kind of like how, if one item is super popular but you determine it to be unfashionable, why is that so bad? Well, um, well, uh, two points here. So one thing is, of course, fashionability is a subjective uh, thing. And in our case, we're just using certain fashion scores that are created by a separate team that um, I hope consists of fashion experts. Um, um, so we're just using that fashion score as uh, the input. And the guideline from the business side is that they would like uh, us to trust this fashion score and to uh, absorb such articles given that they are popular enough. Um, the second thing about, um, of course, as I said, the different objectives, they can contradict, they, they, can, they can be a trade-off. So some articles can be very popular but non-fashionable. Others can be uh, fashionable but not popular. 
and we have to balance that. And um, also, I would like to mention that this uh, this is concerned with a ranking of the whole catalog, um, like the whole result set, before um, all the further steps that are applied afterwards. Um, and so we just need to balance this. Okay, do we have any other questions? Hi, Alexei. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so you, you explained pretty well about the, you know, the uh, gray dots and the orange dots with the, um, uh, yes, this one, the, mm -hmm. the, the dominating and the dominated results, right? Uh, however, I think somehow I, I, and you also explained the convex uh, functional composition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to make an objective function out of multiple objectives. Now, from here, what you explained was that the dominating uh, records or dots there mm -hmm. uh, are dominating only uh, are dominating as long as they are in one dimension, right? Mm. Uh, well, domination means, like, say, this dot is dominating this one because uh, when you go from this dot to this dot, you improve both objective two and objective one. So, yeah, so, 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 what I was wondering was like, if 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 your objective function is uh, well defined as dom as selecting for or optimizing for dominating records, which are dominating on all dimensions, right? Then uh, it's a little bit surprising that the outcome you get is uh, that the results with. Uh, optimality only in one objective's dimension are being pushed up rather than both. Uh, so How do you explain that? Uh -huh. uh, sorry. Um, so I think that the effect here was that the algorithm was bringing up both items that users interacted with and uh, items that this are fashionable, but not necessarily uh, the ones that users interacted with. So we, uh, we, um, my hypothesis is that we got a mixture of uh, fashionable and non-fashionable but popular items on the top of our uh, result sets, and that's how the the algorithm managed to optimize both of the objectives and bring the improvement to both of them. But this is not what we wanted. Actually, we wanted to bring up relatively popular and relatively fashionable things. Okay, do we have one final question? It's got to be, it's Doug or Max, isn't it? I have to choose between you. <laughs> okay, Doug. Actually, I have a learning turn question. So, I noticed when you compute NDCG, you just simply take the clicks or the purchases. Um, do you compensate for any kind of position bias when you do that? Um, well, in, in these experiments, we were not correcting for any position bias, but this is um, something we're working on. Like, there's a separate stream um, concerning with, concerned with uh, position bias removal. And I was just curious, just a last question, and because I think this affects a lot of people in the room, um, I'd be curious on your thoughts on NDCG for a grid of um, grid display of search results, because so many classic search metrics expect a list, and I presume you guys show a grid, and whether or not the NDCG uh, really captures the sort of the ranking involved that you want to optimize. Um, yeah, that, that's a, a good point. Um, indeed, we, we do show a grid of items instead of uh, just a list. But for now, we, we, we've been just using NDCG. So we didn't account for our specific display. Fantastic. Thank you, Alexi. Thank you.